Good afternoon. My name's Scott Silsby. I live in Fairfax County near the Arlington border, and my stomping ground is all around the uh, Potomac Valley, right around Little Falls, down to Roosevelt Island and up. And all my grandparents and parents are all from the district. But during the war, they sent Daddy to Virginia, so uh, that's my apology. Uh, what I want to do today is just show some of the basic things about prehistoric people in this area, how they made their tools, a little bit how they used them, where some of the stone came from. But what brought them to this area was the Potomac River and primarily the fish and also the migratory waterfowl. During the Ice Age, say of about 10,000 years ago, the fall line marched up Potomac and 5,000 years ago it was firmly established between Key Bridge and Little Falls. Indians were here, they would intercept the fish. Sturgeon, striped bass, some great bands would come down, set up camps, a lot of them were seasonal. There were local people that lived here all year. But that event drew people from many miles away and there's a scattering of the artifacts that show that exotic artifacts were brought here and used here and lost here. And so perhaps the old interpretation of the name of Potomac or Potomac as a place of something brought or a trading place, there may be, uh, may be a grain of truth in that old, old legend. Washington, D.C. and environs reaching out for, you know, 50, 60 miles or so, very famous for cobble and boulder pebble fields of quartzite, very hard, durable, welded together sandstone that has been welded to the point where it breaks a bit like flint. Washington, D.C. itself is very famous because at the turn of the century, William Henry Holmes, he was our earliest archaeologist in the area who also practiced what we today call lithic technology, and that is breaking of rocks to make useful tools. And from that, they could tell, oh, it's pretty, pretty solid. I can look where I've broken it already that it's not the best. This sample I found recently, and it shows this was done by heat. This boulder, and also I can see a little reddish on it. There's not much left, but that's the iron. They heated these up in big fires, and they would crack apart. And afterwards, they'd get the right size cobbles, and a flake was driven here. This was hit with a hammer here, and a beautiful flake came out here. That flake was taken away the core was left. This shows heat treating. There's part of a rind of a surface, the smooth cobble surface of the pebble, with a lot of reddening up on that surface. When I turn it over, you can see it's more tannish in the middle. And that's from a heat treated flake. After they took it off that other core, they worked this and got just a little knife edge and took a chip here, and uh, which may have had something to do with just a good place to hold it. But this was used as just a little utility edge, a little knife, and then discarded. Depending on what the culture's needs are, they would make decisions at quarries uh, what to keep and what not to keep. And we have found caches up um, just above Great Falls, about a mile inland, they found a cache of about 40 of these rhyolite preforms, about like this by about that thick that had been all stacked like firewood in a pit and they were very carefully excavated and they weighed, the whole thing weighed maybe 30 pounds, enough for a person to put in a pack. And they bring them down storm on the sites. This one we'll take it through. I'm going to use the rock, but uh, we'll take it through a little bit and show what they um, might have been going towards. In the winter, when they may have been getting low on rock and couldn't travel, they were, as one archaeologist used to love to say, said they were more parsimonious with the rock. They were, uh, they were tight wads. So in times of plenty, you see waste. They were just as human as all of us. By having these little flakes all the way around the edge, the rock becomes a lot stronger. Here I have a big piece of antler. This came off of a moose. The intent of this is to make a big, make a big preformed knife, kind of a heavy, large, rugged, rugged one that can be used for anything. And while it's while it's servicing as a large, almost like a machete, it can have flakes taken off of it to resharpen it, and the flakes that come off become tools themselves. 
see a person that's real good on a keyboard, a person playing pool, all those ability to read angles, coordination, if you don't have it, you didn't survive very well. If you had it, you survived. And then the same thing's going on in weaving baskets or nets. People that had the ability to mathematically remember patterns and knots and fabric had strong baskets to carry things and lots of food. Those that didn't, didn't make it. See a lot, a lot of artifacts that are made today, recent made ones, their whole intent is to make it real thin and pretty. But most Stone Age folks weren't interested in that. They weren't making them for museums. They were, they were making them to, making them to survive. When we're through with this, we'll compare it to one that was recovered in the Frederick Valley, just above the city. As they're making these, they start to get a refined shape. You get refined flakes, and these are the ones that are often not found at the quarries. They would look for these, and they would collect them and save them, and out of this would be made points and drills and scrapers and tools. And these, I suspect they did like the Australians, they had leaves, something like this poplar leaf, and they just had a little system of wrapping up to protecting those edges. And then they'd lay them in in a pattern side by side by side by side, and occasionally on a site you'll find a cache of flakes. And what they're doing is they're trying to protect some of these edges. This is almost like a bevel knife. It's fairly flat on this side, and the cutting edge is here. These little tiny flakes are actually collected by the archaeologists, examined, classified depending on the culture and the technology. This stone is nowhere near as strong as, say, a high-grade flint but there was a lot of it. So they had a lot of failure rate, which was good for archeology span because you can see what they were doing. It wasn't good for them. The little edge is gonna cut your buckskin apart. You can find a flake that'll fit underneath there. This one's out of the um, Monocacy Valley when I first got out of the Army back in the mid-60s. I was up looking at a used bookstore up in Braddock Heights and someone had them for sale up on a big piece of cardboard and there was a bunch of them and you can see there's a remnants of cave deposit. Someone had taken them out of one of those limestone rock shelters up there, dug them up, you know, it's before they knew, they didn't know what was good or bad. And this is called a Fox Creek biface. These are often found in caches, and these big flake scars are where they're going to whittle it down to get flakes. But meanwhile, they can use it as a rough knife, as a chisel, a drill, a spike, uh, debarking. They're just useful. As these things become more symmetrical, the shape and size of the flakes are more determined. And these would be often kept if it was a good shaped flake and they were looking for a lot of little blanks to make arrowheads or drill bits, they would save these. When they had a bunch of these flakes, they could work on maybe 10 of them at once, and five would come out, the others would break. They could use a hard rock to quickly outline the flake. They may be making a little stemmed, small knife. Put a little bit of oil on that, and you can see where the flakes actually meet in the middle and that way you can whittle and get that hump off. And then from there you can go to pressure flaking and percussion on the same one. And that's probably more realistic, is to uh, mix those technologies to what they need. And that's the kind of pressure flake you get with just a deer antler like that. I'll take one right beside it here, and then it'll leave the scars of two pressure flakes coming together and what's left behind is a zigzag, wavy, very sharp line with those little, those little pattern flake scars you see. If we wanted to put this on something like it could be the foreshaft for a spear or the end of an arrow or a little knife handle or whatever, we can probably just split it. 
And what I want to do is I don't want to have that stuff. So I've got just a piece of flint here that's glued in here with rawhide around it. And I just want to whittle this a little bit down. I'm going to flip it over, see if that's in a better angle. Right in the center, I want to have a little flat spot right about where the pith is, because that's my splitting point. And before I split it, I want to tie this off so the split doesn't run too far. To tie it off, I need to either have to have some sinew or I need to have some string or rope. I need to get my water, so I'm going to go over and get a little water. Get that a little damp. This is the inner bark, the inner bark of basswood. And it makes a medium strength, medium strength fiber. I red it, meaning I take it off in the spring and I put it in a nice stream like it's behind us and let it rot a little bit and little microorganisms go for the sugar and starch between the layers of the bark fiber. And after about two weeks, three weeks, I can take out these nice fibers. And these fibers are useful for making like a cord or a string that I can use to tie stuff. And here it's nice to have an assistant. So I can get my appointed assistant over here and they can just pinch it right there. And all I have to do is have two that are about equal and I spin to the left, spin to the left, or you can do it both to the right, but I spin left, left, wrap right. Left, left, wrap right, left, left. There's an account of the Indians down south on the lower Potomac between the Rappahannock and the Potomac is the northern neck. Each group would build a large net and it's to catch deer or to keep deer from crossing it. And they could stretch it from the Rappahannock to the Potomac River, which was a long ways, talking many miles. And that would keep the deer from jumping it and they could force them down into the water and then out of their canoes, they could uh, harvest as many deer as they needed for their, to make their buckskin clothes and to get the bone for making tools. And if they had antlers, they could use the antler. And of course, the meat goes without saying. That was a lot of the, the protein. When they had enough, they'd let the, it's like the chinkatig ponies, you know, you take as many off of the island as you need and the rest of them stay on and, and go about their business. Once I get it down to where I have it, just about where I want it, then we can just tie, put a little simple loop through it just to hold it. When it's wet, it's not quite as strong as when it's dry, but it's one like this, I can tighten those coils up a little bit, and then I'll grab the other end, and then I'll pull this tight. If we allow that to dry, it'll shrink just a little bit as the moisture goes out of it. But this is considerably stronger than most of the cord, natural cord that you buy in the stores, and it's much better, higher quality. You can make that yourself rather rapidly. If you make it out of sinew, it's very strong. But things like dogbane, uh, which is also known as wolfsbane to the wild people, and milkweed are extremely strong. They're, they're good for bowstring. This is not quite strong enough for bowstring. And I mean, this is, this is nothing more than just tying a couple of knots. And then I can look at the, I can look at the crack that's starting on both sides. I'll turn that around a little. And that looks, that looks acceptable, pretty good. All I want to do is open that up a little bit. And then if I want, if I want to do a fancy job, I can take my little whittling knife, which is just nothing more than a little thing, and I can cut out a little bit of a ledge or I can pry it up a little bit and I can saw it a little bit and do the same thing to the other side. And then I put it back in and I'll look and see if I'm getting alignment. And now I'm going like, yeah, that'll be, that'll be acceptable for what I'm doing, the curvature of the flake. This would normally be dried. This would be heated up over fire, drops of hot resin. You heat it up, it drives out the sugars and the starches and the turpentine. And then when it goes back in, it's a lot like a hot milk glue. And that would be held in position, put in, and then held until that dried. And then instead of using this, we would use sinews and use it just to tie it. And I have a little knot on the end, that's good.
then we take a little bit, a little bit of sandstone, quartzite. We'll take just the edge of that off so it doesn't cut the sinew. And if we had the resin that was heated up in there, that would hold real good until about three days later when the moisture came out of the wood. And then it would become loose as the wood dried. So they'd normally do this on dry wood, but we did this to show how it's done. So primitive, but effective. But most of these were made of just a little, just as a little knife. So the handle may be cut off like that. It might have a little sheath to go into to protect it. And these are scattered all over the district. They all, you know, people call them airheads. And some of them were used for airheads, but most of them are just little utility knives and something to dig a splinter out or process leather or what have you. This shows the concept of the foreshaft. This is that little piece of um, little stick that we had of arrowwood, and I've worked it down a little more. And that little point, little utility point we made is hafted in there. So they could use this, you know, for a knife or point, whatever they needed it for. But it was just simply split, dug out a little bit. There's a little pine rosin, and then there's wet sinew and hide glue over top of it. I've waterproofed it. They would use like a pine rosin and let it dry a few days. But the idea here is there was a lot of different things called cane. They were hollow. Um, in the New World, there's about 10 varieties of bamboo. There were a couple varieties around here that we know about, river cane and switch cane. Lots of straight sticks that were hollow, how to utilize them. So where knocks were going to be put on, they could shove wood down inside with glue and have a good solid piece of wood. For shaft, it had an advantage. When you went hunting, a lot of times this would stick in the animal and the arrow would release and you'd get the arrow back and this would, be, would wind up in the animal or be broken. And so you could reload and use the same arrow over and over again. So this was used through spears, darts, and arrows. I showed making a arrowhead, a point, a little small knife, and I thought now we'd show what could be done with it. Um, this is one that was made a long time ago, and it's a little, a little flint triangular point on the end of an arrow. And I shot it into a rotted, rotted bunch of logs on the side of the ground. And this is kind of a replica area. It's tried to have tried to duplicate what an early one would look like. The type of fletching, and that's the end of the arrow, they needed something in the back to help guide it. And the early ones, we think, uh, used three whole small feathers. Today, we're going to compromise a little bit. I'm going to use one that's reinforced with sinew. I put some extra feathers to slow it down and to make it more visible. And on the other end, like they do in most of the major movies where you see arrows flying through the air, they take these rubber blunts. If you have an arrow, then you have to have something to throw it. So we could have something like a throwing stick or an atlatl. But the size of the arrows that are found say that no, they'd come up with something different. So we have a bent stick that has a string and it has some kind of a grip area. I wanted to show one. This is called English. Eskimo, which is two fingers below and one finger above. I have a little pad to protect my sensitive little fingers. Another way to do it is just a pinch grip, and that you usually make the knock of the arrow a little larger, give you something to grab it, and that works well. Some people had thumb rings made out of jade or agate to hook it. The last wild Indian showed up in California and amazed the anthropologist by showing an entirely different way that had never been recorded. He'd hold the bow from underneath, rest the arrow between and on top of fingers, and then he reached his hand around, and he put a middle finger on that side, index finger there, and then the thumb would lock over top, and he would hold it thus, and it shot it. Part of archery is concentrating. Zen is one where you concentrate to a point where everything else is sort of obliterated. And I found myself when I'm really concentrating, you're looking in a tunnel because everything's great and I hear no sound, see nothing. 